Hello and welcome to The Lincoln Journey. I'm your host, Grant Veter, and today I will present part seven of The Conspirators, the story of the Lincoln assassination. Last time we took a wild detour to demonstrate how Mary Lincoln's erratic behavior kept Ulysses and Julia Grant from accompanying the Lincolns to Ford's Theater on the night of the assassination. Today we will try to get back on track. I apologize for giving myself up to speculation in the last episode. If Ulysses S. Grant had gone to Ford's Theater on April 14th with Abraham Lincoln, he may have been assassinated along with the president, or as noted Civil War historian Ken Lifetog has pointed out to me, the presence of Grant and his retinue may have prevented Lincoln's death at this juncture or they may have postponed Booth's plans until a more opportune time. But the Grant story is a good reminder that there was probably more that we don't know about the plans and activities of Booth and company than what we do know. We infer a great number of things, sometimes with more confidence and plausibility than at others. So history will remain an inexact science which brings us back to the afternoon of Friday, April 14th. After the cabinet meeting that was attended by General Grant, the president went for a carriage ride with his first lady. Mary later said she had never seen her husband so happy. He talked about visiting Europe and the Holy Land. They stopped at the Navy Yard and went on board the huge ironclad Montauk, which was under repairs. Around the same time, Several hundred Confederate prisoners were being marched through town on the way to a prison camp. John Wilkes Booth was just leaving Grover's National Theater after confirming that Mary Lincoln, though invited, would not be attending the gala at the National that night. As he mounted his rented horse, John Matthews waved him down and drew his attention to the prisoners a ways off. Booth rubbed his forehead in despair and said, Great God, I no longer have a country. He gave Matthews a letter that he wanted him to deliver to the National Intelligence or newspaper the next day if Booth should go away that night. Matthews readily agreed and just then saw the Grant's carriage loaded with luggage and headed toward the train station. Matthews drew this to Booth's attention and Booth spurred his steed to overtake them and to disconcert them with his malevolent stare. Booth's next move is well documented, but very curious. He went to the Kirkwood house, where both Vice President Johnson and his intended assassin, George Atzerodt, had rooms and left a message, not for Atzerodt, but for Johnson. He penciled a note which said, don't wish to disturb you, are you at home? J. Wilkes Booth. This is quite the mystery because first of all, he didn't wait for a response to the message, which the clerk just put in Johnson's mailbox anyway. Also, what did he intend to accomplish? Was he just seeking to establish Johnson's whereabouts? Did he distrust Atzerodt as well he ought to have? If so, did he intend to take Johnson's assassination in hand on his own or was he preparing the way for another assassin? It is another reminder that what we know, we know imperfectly, and that there is much we don't know. But let us press on. Atzerodt made his own effort to prepare for his assignment. He asked a man in the lobby of the Kirkwood house if he knew where Andrew Johnson was staying. The man pointed to a man in the dining room. The vice president was eating supper. Satisfied, Atzerodt walked away. At some point, Booth was at Ford's Theater, preparing the presidential box for his intended visit that night. He carved a niche in the wall of a small entryway that would allow him to insert a post in such a way as to prevent the door from being opened from the outside. Then he bored a small chest-high peephole in the next door, 
which entered directly onto the box. These alterations passed unnoticed when Harry Ford and others were later decorating the box. What of the movements of the Surratt that didn't get away? Mary Surratt and Louis Whiteman took a carriage ride to the tavern at Surrattsville. She said she was looking for a man who owed her money, hoping to collect soon to satisfy a creditor who was pressing her to pay her own debt. She also had a package and a message for tavern keeper John Lloyd. He was to have those shooting irons that John Surratt had secreted in the joists of the kitchen ceiling, ready to be picked up that night, along with a couple of bottles of whiskey. He obediently, and at least to the satisfaction of the eventual military tribunal, unquestioningly laid the two carbines on a bed along with the package, which he found to contain binoculars. Mary and Lewis ate supper at the tavern and headed back to Washington around 6.30 p.m. Like Booth, Davy Harold and George Atzerott secured rented horses that day. Lewis Powell did not. Harold promised the stableman he would return his horse, a gentle roan that Harold favored, that evening. In contrast, Booth's horse was a spirited bay mare. Her owner warned Booth that she didn't like to be tied up and would likely break loose if tied. At 8 p.m., the play Our American Cousin began at Ford's Theater. Abraham and Mary Lincoln and their guests, Clara Harris and her fiance, Major Henry Rathbone, arrived about 20 minutes late and were greeted with warm applause. The band struck up Hail to the Chief as they worked their way through the audience to their box. Not far away, Mary Surratt had returned from Surrattsville to her townhouse on H Street. John Wilkes Booth was waiting for her. They spoke for a few minutes, then he departed. He rode his horse into Baptist Alley behind the theater. He had been observed there earlier, racing his horse down the alley, returning, and then galloping down again. Mindful that his mare didn't like to be tied, he asked for his friend, theater employee Ned Spangler, to hold the reins for him. Spangler was busy with stage properties and told Peanut John Burroughs, an employee who sold peanuts in the theater, but who was presently engaged with watching the back door, to hold Booth's horse. Booth stepped inside momentarily, but then went next door to the Star Saloon, where he ordered whiskey and water. Meanwhile, Lewis Powell, armed with a revolver and a dagger, and accompanied by Davy Harold as a getaway guide, Powell was an out-of-towner, is approaching the house of Secretary of State Seward, who lies in bed swaddled with bandages. Vice President Johnson is in his room at the Kirkwood House, and George Atzerott, also sporting a revolver and a dagger, is in the Kirkwood House bar getting drunk. Booth did not immediately approach the President's box. The plan was for the conspirators to conduct their attacks simultaneously around 10 p.m. to maximize the resulting terror. It was about 10 o'clock when Booth entered Taltaville's Star Saloon, immediately adjacent to the theater, for his drink. Eight blocks away and about two blocks from the White House, Lewis Powell rang the doorbell to Secretary Seward's home and said he had a prescription for Seward from the doctor who had left about a half hour earlier. This story, made plausible by a package tied with string, presumably done up by former pharmacist assistant Harold, was enough to gain him entrance to the house while Harold stood in the shadows with their horses. Once in the house, however, Powell's insistence that he must deliver the medicine personally to the secretary met with resistance. Back at Ford's theater at roughly the same time, Booth was either carefully gauging his actions to coincide with the attack at the Seward House, or he was trying to work up the courage to approach the President's theater box. Or maybe there was some other explanation, but in point of fact, he was walking in and out of the back of the theater, occasionally glancing at the large clock on the wall. Finally, he walked around to the back of the second level from which Lincoln's box was reached and approached an attendant seated there. I won't call him a guard. It isn't fair to say that valet Charles Forbes 
was supposed to be on guard. Booth showed Forbes a card or some such. Sources aren't clear. What was on the piece of paper wasn't as important as Booth's eminently recognizable face. Forbes made no effort to impede Booth as he walked into the anteroom of the box. Once inside the anteroom, Booth took the sawed-off piece of pine music stand that he had left there that afternoon and wedged the outer door shut. Then he presumably peeked through the hole he had bored earlier, and when he saw the coast was clear, he quietly opened the door. On stage, Asa Trenchard, the American cousin of the title, has been left alone by the snooty Mrs. Mount Chessington, who had huffed out after criticizing his manners. Actor Harry Hawk delivered Trenchard's retort. Don't know the manners of good society, eh? Well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal, you sock dologizing old man trap. The line was a proven laugh getter, and Booth is typically credited with waiting for it so that the laugh would cover the sound of him shooting President Lincoln in the back of the head. But the pistol report was heard throughout the theater. Some thought it was part of the play. Theater staff knew otherwise. That was not in the piece, said Harry Clay Ford, as he and others came from the back to see what was going on. They were in time to see a friend of theirs rise up on the stage, brandishing a knife. What had happened seconds before wasn't immediately clear, but it probably wasn't good. Ticket agent Joe Sesford said, by God then, is John Booth crazy? Booth had shot the president, shouted sick semper tyrannis, struggled with Major Rathbone, gashing him from the elbow to the shoulder and leaping about 12 feet down to the stage. At about the same time, Lewis Powell was making his attempt to kill William Seward, which for sustained horror and cumulative gore beats the Lincoln attack all to flinders. Powell looked pretty suspicious as soon as he crossed the Seward threshold when he refused to give up his medicine package, improbably telling the servant who admitted him that it was doctor's orders that he give it directly to the secretary. The servant, a 19-year-old African-American named William Bell, insisted that Powell hand him the package, but Powell began to repeat over and over, I must go up, I must go up. After five minutes of this, he started to edge toward the stairs. This put Bell in a dangerous position. A black man trying to physically restrain a white man, regardless of his justification, imperiled his life in that day and culture. Bell wisely chose a middle course. He ascended the stairs with Powell as he continued to remonstrate with him and chided him for tromping so loudly when the secretary needed peace and quiet. Bell was no doubt relieved when they were met at the top of the stairs by Secretary of Seward's son, Frederick. Powell's twine-tied package continued to support his cover story, and Frederick Seward, rather than smelling a rat, just thought that Powell was extraordinarily stupid. He continued Bell's argument to hand over the medicine, and Powell continued to mechanically resist. The standoff in the hallway wasn't loud enough to alarm others in the house, and so when Frederick's sister, Fanny, came out of the elder Seward's room, she innocently whispered, Fred, father is awake now, revealing which room contained the secretary. Powell did not immediately try to bowl his way in. Cagely, he continued to argue, and then when Frederick told him to give him the medicine or take it back to the doctor, he appeared to acquiesce to the latter, turning and starting down the stairs. Bell preceded him, and satisfied that Powell was leaving, Fred Seward turned back towards his room. His antagonists thus separated, Powell suddenly reversed and sprang up the stairs. At this, Fred turned around, and found himself facing a large revolver. Powell pulled the trigger. The gun went click. It had misfired, saving Fred's life, but just barely. Rather than cocking the pistol again and chambering another round, Powell started to savagely beat Fred's head with the gun. He hit him so hard he made the gun inoperable. He crushed Fred's skull to the point that part of his brain was exposed. Horror struck, 
William Bell ran out of the house shouting, murder. This made Davy Harold a trifle uneasy. Inside William Seward's room, Fanny heard thumping and thought the servants were chasing a rat. With her in the room was Sergeant George Robinson, the nurse with whom Powell had conversed on his earlier reconnaissance. Robinson was a veteran on light duty, recovering from combat wounds. Becoming concerned, Fanny said to him, what can be the matter? Do go and see. They both went to the door and Robinson opened it. Directly outside was Fred Seward, his head streaming with blood, and Lewis Powell, who immediately smashed his knife into Robinson's forehead, stunning him. Powell pushed past Robinson and Fanny and threw himself onto Seward's bed. Powell planted his left hand on Seward's chest and began to strike viciously with his knife. However, in the dark room, his aim was off, and at first he merely ripped up the bedclothes. But with his third blow, he tore open Seward's cheek, exposing his teeth and fractured jawbone. Further slashes were aimed at his throat, but a metal brace designed to immobilize Seward's jaw prevented his jugular from being severed. Before Powell could strike a fatal blow, George Robinson had recovered and closed with him. While the two hardened Civil War veterans clinched, Fanny started to scream and kept up a continuous wail. She opened the window to cry for help. In the dark street below, Davy Harold decided it was time to go. He left Powell's horse and rode off alone. Fanny's screaming woke another Seward son, Augustus. When he entered the dark room, he thought his father was delirious and Robinson was trying to restrain him. But soon both he and Robinson were trying with all their might to remove the strapping Powell from the room. As Robinson clutched him from behind, Powell struck backwards with his knife and cut Robinson's shoulder to the bone. Gus was also pierced to the bone, but the pair still wouldn't let go and they finally wrestled Powell into the light of the hallway. When Gus and Powell came face to face, Powell said, I'm mad, I'm mad. By now he had Robinson in a chokehold, but instead of administering a coup de grace with his knife, he punched George in the face and ran down the stairs. On the way down, he caught up with the fleeing State Department messenger and stabbed him in the back, giving him a serious but not fatal wound. In fact, despite all the mayhem Powell caused in the Seward house that night, covering the walls and floors with blood and grievously wounding William Fred and Gus Seward, George Robinson, and messenger Emmerich Hansel, no one died. Powell dropped his knife, mounted his horse, and tried to gallop away. However, the horse was content to trot despite Powell's blows and curses. William Bell and three soldiers from the house next door nearly caught him, but he finally got his horse up to speed and escaped. Fanny Seward and George Robinson returned to Secretary Seward's room and found him crumpled on the floor. Fanny thought he was a pile of bedclothes. Robinson tenderly returned him to his bed. Seward whispered, I am not dead. Send for the police and surgeon and close the house. I'll see you next time for The Conspirators, Part 8.